All right, our final paper before uh, we take a quick coffee break is from David Klinowski. He is a visiting assistant professor of business economics at the Katz Business School at the University of Pittsburgh. David's research is in the areas of behavioral and experimental economics, often with a focus on better understanding um, the determinants of gender gaps in education, academia, and labor markets more generally. All right, um, thanks so much to the organizers for um, including me in the program. Uh, so this, this project asks who writes post-publication criticisms with a focus on gender differences. Uh, so sociologists of science and uh, philosophers of science have described how scientists advance knowledge by uh, generating new ideas, what they call conjectures or discovery, but they, they, they also generate ideas or advance science by uh, criticism and debate of ideas, what they call refutations or resistance by scientists to scientific discovery. Yet we rarely, if ever, make this decomposition of science into these two components when we study gender differences in participation in academic science. We know and we've heard today uh, that women are missing in science um, uh, in many different ways or uh, dimensions, uh, for example, uh, as authors in the scientific literature, uh, in the faculty of most fields. But the question I ask in this project is, are women missing even more in the criticisms component of science? And I argue that studying this question can help us to better understand when and why women might be missing in, in academic science. The way I study this is by looking at two standard or formal ways scientists communicate post-publication criticisms in the literature. One of them is by commenting by writing comments to uh, criticize or correct a published paper. And the other one is uh, with uh, replications that disagree with a previous finding. And I'll give you examples and details of this in a second. Um, but what I do in the project is I um, document, I use bibliometric data to document gender gaps in authorship in these types of papers. Then I use the data to explore some potential mechanisms for these gender gaps. And finally, I use an experiment to probe on one potential mechanism more, cl more cleanly, uh, which is related to behavioral gender differences. Uh, so today I'll just talk a little bit about the comments, replications, experiment, and I'll, I'll close. Uh, so as I said, comments are short papers or um, notes intended specifically to criticize or correct a published study. Uh, comments are typically peer reviewed and submitted for publication to the same journal as the article being commented on. They are relatively rare in economics, uh, the field I work in. For example, in the AER, you see on average a comment for every 17.5 papers, but they are more common in other fields. For example, medicine in JAMA, I see on average a comment for every 1.1 paper. And they can be important for the literature and for the commenter. Uh, for example, in, in nature, the likelihood that a paper gets retracted grows nine times after receiving a comment. And while certainly comments do not receive as many citations as regular papers, they can be well cited. For example, in the AR, the 25% most cited comments receive more citations than 25% of papers in the AR. So even by the st high standards of, of the AR, comments can be well cited. But comments can also take a confrontational tone, and journals themselves have sometimes contributed to framing comments in a confrontational tone. For example, here's a quote from the then official description of the comments section in the journal Nature, which is obviously one of the most uh, widely read and uh, prestigious scientific journals. It says, a reader may submit an attack on the core of a paper. It is in our duty to take it up with the authors and referees. If the attack turns out to be well-founded, a retraction or correction will follow. Uh, let me just show you a couple of examples um, of what comments look like, or at least their abstracts. This is one chosen for no particular reason from the AR. It more or less says a previous paper estimated some effects. Uh, however, we find that these effects are inflated and we propose an alternative estimation strategy. Here's an example from JAMA. A previous paper found that an intubation strategy was associated with greater survival. Uh, we have some concerns regarding the results and the applicability of the conclusion. So all, all the comments I examine in the data are of this critical type. And 
um, in uh, the data consists of all regular papers and comments published in a period of seven to 22 years in these six journals, the AER, the ASR, which is a flagship journal of the American Sociological Association, JAMA, the flagship journal of the American Medical Association, and the three foremost multidisciplinary journals, Nature, PNAS, and Science. And the reason I study these, these journals is that they all organize their papers in a way that make it, makes it very clear what is a critical comment versus what is a research paper. And they're all high impact journals that collectively cover a wide range of uh, natural and social sciences. And so in this data, I can see, or I can examine what is the share of female authors of uh, regular papers versus comments. And that's uh, one main result that I'll show you now. So for each of the six journals, we'll see across time this, the share of female authors. Uh, first for uh, regular papers, you see uh, it is around 25 to 35%, except in economics, uh, 10 to 15%. And notice that the access, uh, sorry about the um, uh, poor rendition. Uh, so the access end at 50%. So we are nowhere near parity to begin with. And notice that this is already a highly selected sample of women who are publishing in these elite, very competitive journals. Uh, so among this um, already selected sample, let's see the share of female authors of comments. Um, that's for most time points and journals, uh, it's lower. In fact, overall it's about uh, 20 to 40% lower and statistically significant. Uh, sorry, I, well, I, well, this is, this is um, uh, summarizing what I just said. So the, the fact that women are missing in comments across all journals examined suggests that this is not a journal specific or a discipline specific phenomenon, but rather factors that apply broadly across academia are, are potentially playing a role. And in the paper, I examine some potential such factors. For example, it may be that within a journal, women are concentrated more in fields or subfields that just happen to receive fewer comments. Um, that's not what's going on. It could be that comments are written by senior authors. And since in general, women tend to be more junior in academia than men, maybe that's why they don't, um, they're not publishing comments. That's also not what's going on. In fact, comments tend to be written by junior authors, which makes it all the more striking that so, so few women are writing comments because if anything, women are relatively more represented in academia among junior uh, scientists. It may be that women don't have co-authors or don't, don't have the right co-authors to publish comments. That's also not what's going on. And uh, since I don't have a lot of time, let me just focus on showing you results uh, regarding this last uh, explanation. Uh, so to see this, let's just think of all papers, all regular papers that have at least one male author and ask of all these papers, how many of them are solo authored by a man, obviously, that's 19%. So with a slight abuse of language, you can think of this as a propensity of men to solo author regular papers. Now let's ask the same for women. Of all regular papers that have at least one female author, how many of those papers are solo authored? That's 16%. Now let's do the same for comments. Of all comments that have at least one male author, how many of those comments are solo authored? That's 33%. So you see the propensity of men to solo author grows for comments relative to regular papers. Uh, now for women, that's zero. In fact, there are no female solo author regular papers or female solo author comments, sorry, in the AER in the 21 years of data that, that I observe. And this is similar across, across journals. Uh, so the propensity of men to, to solo author grows for comments. Uh, for women, it drops. Uh, for JAMA, for women, it grows, but not nearly as much as it does for men. Uh, the same for nature, uh, PNAS and science. And uh, yeah, this table again, just to say that these are significant differences in differences. And so obviously there are many, many explanations, um, uh, or many factors that could, could be contributing and are probably contributing to, to, the, to this gender gaps in criticism that I, I just showed and are factors different from the ones I mentioned. Um, so now I'll show you results from failed replications. And one nice thing about the data from failed replications is that it, it can speak a bit to some of these other potential mechanisms. So for example, it may be that um, women, they criticize as much as men, but um, perhaps their criticisms are getting, or their comments are getting rejected during peer review more often. Or it may be that women just have to prioritize novelty more so than men, right? So obviously in the profession, we value 
original papers more than criticisms. And so if women face greater barriers to career progression, perhaps it makes sense for them to focus more on writing regular papers and not criticisms. Uh, so the, the data from failed replications will be able to speak a bit uh, to, this, to these mechanisms. Uh, so the data on this part comes from BioArchive, which is the leading pre, uh, repository of preprints in the life sciences, and it covers uh, a wide range of, of life sciences. Uh, sorry. So um, I, I look in this data at all preprints I have imposted on the, on the platform from its start in 2013 to, to the end of 2019. And in, uh, what's, what's important for me is, or one, one nice thing about this for me is that preprints once posted can be edited, but cannot be removed from the platform. And also uh, importantly for me, when authors post their preprint on the platform, they have to choose whether the paper is one that reports new results, confirmatory results or contradictory results. And as stated in BioArchive, new results describe an advance in the field whereas confirmatory and contradictory results are replications that either confirm or disagree with a, with a previous paper. And so I'll look at the share of female authors uh, for each of these types of papers. Uh, and that's us, I'll show you that now. Uh, so across time, the share of female authors of um, new, new results between 25 and 35%, a similar trend for successful replications for failed replications, it's a drop of about 19%. Um, let's, let's skip this. So the, this, this drop is even starker if we focus on the first author of each paper. So in most or in many of the life sciences, the, the convention is to list first the author who uh, contributed most to the paper or pushed the project forward. And so among first authors, the share of female authors is uh, between 20, 25 and 35% for new results similar trend for uh, successful replications, um, a 40% drop for failed replications. And finally, also again, so these are significant, uh, significant difference. And finally, for solo author uh, preprints, um, the share of female authors or female uh, or papers by a female solo author, that's 10% uh, for um, new results about 14% for successful replications and 6% for failed replications. This time, these differences are not significant. I think largely because of a small number of, of replications that are solo authored. Um, so as I said, I think the data from, from, from BioArchive are, are interesting because they uh, indicate that women can be missing in criticisms even prior to peer review. And the fact that we see women in successful replications, but not in failed replications, suggests that the reason we don't see them in failed replications is not that they're prioritizing novelty, because we do see them in uh, successful replications. Uh, and like, like I said a few minutes ago, there are many explanations consistent with, with, um, with these results. Uh, so I'll focus on an experiment that, um, that just uh, tries to probe one mechanism, right? So you could imagine well, so there may be behavioral differences going on, for example, differences in preferences or beliefs between men and women. Um, women may also be anticipating being discriminated in the peer review process or receiving backlash either accurately or inaccurately. And so in the experiment, I just probe one mechanism related to behavioral differences, which is differences between men and women in preferences for pointing out a mistake in someone's work and taking away credit earned from that mistake, right? And so, Obviously, I'm not with this. I'm not ruling out other potential mechanisms. Quite the opposite. Uh, I'm going to construct an environment that abstracts away from other mechanisms, precisely because they could be playing a role. And I can ask: in this more stylized environment, do we still see differences in behavior between men and women? All right. So, just very briefly. Uh, so, in the experiment, I match subjects into pairs. You can think of one of them as the author and the other as the commenter. The author performs an effort task for a dollar, and there's a 50% false positive rate here. So that means that if the author solves the task correctly, they earn a dollar for sure. If they solve the task incorrectly, then with 50% chance, they receive zero, but with 50% chance, they receive $1. And they don't learn, um, or the author doesn't learn whether they solve the task correctly, they just earn, uh, learn their earnings, right? So that's the sense in which there's a false positive here, analogous to introducing a false positive in, in the literature. 
And so as I said, the author is informed of the earnings, but not of whether they solve the task correctly. And they learn that their actual payment depends on the decision of the other subject they're matched to the, the commenter who also performs the effort task for a dollar, this time without a false positive. And but before performing the task, they have to decide whether to contest. And I, I didn't use this language in the, in the experiment. I use neutral language, but contesting means basically to choose to tell the author that they made a mistake and take away that false positive dollar if there was in fact a false positive. Right? And, and I implement this as a contingent decision. That means that if the commenter decides to contest, their decision is implemented only if there is in fact a false positive and they solve the task correctly. And so I do this to minimize the potential role of the commenter's beliefs in their decision to contest. And so the, their beliefs about whether the author solved the task correctly and whether they would solve the task correctly um, if they have to perform it. All right, and, and in terms of monetary consequences, the, the commenter's choice to contest is basically a choice of deducting a dollar from the author under some contingency. And you can imagine if we observe gender differences uh, in, in the choice of contest, they may be due to differences between men and women in their preferences over distributing money uh, between self and the, other, the, the, the author. And so to control or to examine this, I conducted a separate uh, treatment, a minister across subjects, in which there is no task, there is no false positive. The, the, the subject only has a choice over two pay of matrices that are equivalent uh, in terms of monetary outcomes to the choice of contesting. So that if I observe any gender differences in this choice and this extra treatment, um, I can use them as a benchmark of gender differences in distribution of preferences. All right, uh, just uh, in the interest of time, I'll show you just one result or the main result in this experiment. I'll show you the share of subjects that choose to contest first in this main treatment. Uh, first for men, uh, that's 40%. Uh, for women, that's 16%. And now let's see uh, in this additional treatment, um, the share of men and women who make the equivalent choice uh, in terms of monetary outcomes. Uh, that's 16% for men and 5% for women. So one interpretation or, or the interpretation I take from this is that women are about 60% less likely to choose to contest in the experiment. About half of that gap is explained by distributional preferences, but there's a significant residual gap that perhaps is attributable to um, or other motivated men to, to contest, uh, perhaps because you know, if they're more motivated to tell the other person that they made a mistake or there's something about taking away credit earned from a mistake. All right, uh, yeah, and so this summarizes, summarizes what I just said. All right, um, so I just want to conclude um, by just, um, again, reminding you, so in this project I ask, are women missing even more in the criticisms component of, of science. Uh, they are missing by 20 to 40% in published comments. Comments are published in journals. And this is not explained by sorting into fields, by seniority or by co-authorship. They're also missing in failed replications in preprints prior to peer review by 16 to 40%. And it doesn't seem to be explained by women prioritizing novelty over criticisms. And then in the experiment, uh, in this environment stripped away of compounds uh, in academia, I find that women are uh, 50 to 60% less likely to point out a mistake in someone's work and uh, take away credit earned from that mistake. Uh, and finally, I think these findings or these results raise questions for us to think about. For example, how much is the process of knowledge accumulation and self-correction in science delayed by the fact that we don't have uh, uh, or we're missing female author criticisms? If we think of academia as a labor market, how much are women's outcomes affected by their lack of participation in this part of, of academia, or are they affected by their participation in, in, uh, in criticisms? Uh, do current proposals to increase replications, for example, uh, to have journals um, have a section for replications, just like they have in, uh, for comments, uh, or to commission replications with guaranteed publication, would that attract men and women equally? And finally, can we redesign the incentives and the way we conduct post-publication criticism in a way that would attract uh, especially women, but also men uh, into this important part of, of science? Right, that's all I have, thank you.
Uh, thanks, David. That was really, really interesting. I had a couple of questions, just trying to understand the experiment at the end, which is so uh, fascinating. Um, first, I was just curious about what the population was of the men and women. And, you know, usually these are undergrads, but um, to get closer to the population of scientists, I don't know if you could try to run such an experiment or if you did among PhD students or people who are kind of entering the research field just to get a more comparable population to, to scientists. Um, the second one, second question relates to, um, you know, this last point of the willingness to sort of take away the dollar and the willingness to engage in this kind of criticism. Um, were the commenters, did they know if the other player, meaning they weren't identified, it was an anonymous lab, I assume, but it, would there be a way in the lab to let the commenter know, hey, we're going to tell this other person that you like proactively took away their their dollar? Are there ways? I, I'm just wondering if like shielding identity or promoting anonymity would change behavior, if there's some kind of protection uh, from backlash, because it seems like that's uh, that's part of the story. Anyway, just a couple ideas, but it was very thought provoking. And thanks. For yeah, no, th thanks. Thanks so much for the questions. I no, I entirely agree. So on the population, so this I run on the, the experiment on prolific. So these are not uh, undergrads. Uh, they uh, they're uh, general, well, I, I, I didn't, my sample is not representative of the U.S. population, but there's, general, there's definitely a wider range of uh, age, for example, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in my experiment and a typical lab experiment. Um, but certainly I didn't, I didn't run this with uh, PhD students or academics, and that's something that I, I gave thought about, and that's, I mean, I, I would like to, to, to do that. Um, in terms of anonymity, so the, the commenter does know that um, they are matched with an author, a, a subject that I call here an author, and that the author will receive a message. So if they choose to contest, the author does receive a message that the other person they're matched to chose to deduct the dollar and tell you that you were wrong. So, so they, they knew, do know that this is a consequence of, of their choice. Um, but perhaps in an in, in, in an in-person experiment, that would have more of an effect uh, because, you know, or you could, you could have a variation where you, you tell them in, in person or, or, or things are not anonymous, obviously in academia, that's a big, big part of, of, of our decisions is the fact that whatever we do, if it's published, it's published there uh, forever. So, so certainly, yeah, that's something that I, I would like to explore. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, is there any match element involved? So do women, are women more likely to comment on articles published by men, women? That was a question I had. And I was actually thinking about what Ted just said and whether or not you could randomize a photograph of the author somehow mm -hmm. in order to try to understand if there's any sort of match effect. I don't know. My hypothesis in economics for what it's worth is that men comment more on women and that women comment more on women, just a guess. Yeah. And women are a minority, obviously. Yes, uh, thanks so much for the question. So I, I have looked at, at this and I do not observe that um, women are receive more comments than men. What I do observe is that junior authors receive typically more comments than, than senior authors. So I, I mean, you could interpret that in many ways. For example, it could be that they do make more mistakes, for example, but it could be also that they're more likely to just, you know, be other people are willing to comment on junior junior authors. Um, but in terms of, of the gender of the recipient, I don't, I don't observe that, 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 that women receive more comments than, than men. No, so I also do not do not see that. So, um, so m both men and women are equally likely to um, comment, be more likely to comment on junior authors, but not uh, differentially on, on the gender of the receipt. But also, as I do more of the more and more granular analysis, I, I lose samples. So, so this is you know it could, it could be that the things are different. Um, yeah, and, and uh, it's interesting about the, the identity or, or the, the way you suggest ident uh, revealing the identity of of. Uh, of, of the recipient in the, in the, in the experiment. Yeah, I, I could imagine that that has an effect and, and that would be something interesting to, to explore. Yeah, I haven't done that. Thank you. This is a question from one of our Zoom participants. Is your data also able to show whether papers with solo female authors or all women teams likely to receive more or fewer comments? Um, I'm wondering if reciprocity could be operating or avoiding conversations if women authors receive more hostile comments generally. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for the question. So, so I think a similar answer applies here. I, as I, 
you know, try to do this more granular analysis. I, I, my sample is reduced. I, I don't see that, um, well, actually I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if I even have enough sample to examine whether a solo author female uh, paper would be more likely to receive a comment. Um, one, one interesting thing I, I, I do see is that for, so in, in two of these journals, I can examine whether the, the fact that the con conditional on the seniority of the author of the paper being commented on, the fact that the, the author is, a, is an editor of the journal is, is, makes it more or less likely to receive a comment. And in fact, in one of the journals, it is definitely uh, observable in the data that um, the paper is less likely to receive a comment if the, if the author is, a, is an editor of, this, of that journal. And so that may speak a little bit to backlash, the idea that maybe you don't want to comment a person who might you know, have, uh, uh, bring some repercussions. Um, yeah, so. All right, thanks so much. All right. Thank you to all of our paper presenters. We're going to take a quick coffee break now. So please feel free to grab some coffee, use the restroom, get some sunlight in the courtyard, and we'll resume shortly. <laughs>